Hei huarahi mā tātou i te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou i a tātou katoa, huie tai ki e. Ko te mehe tua tahi ki te atua, nana ihanga i ngā mea katoa. Ko te mehe tua rua ki ngā mate, haere, haere, haere. Kia koutou ti honga ora, ngā manuhiri kua tai mai, tina koutou, tina koutou, tina koutou tātou katoa. Ko kakipuka te maunga, ko waipa te awa, nō tikuiti ahau, ko te atatū ahau e noho ana, kei sportway takere ahau, e mahi ana, ko Caitlin Makau toku mingua, nō reira tina koutou, tina koutou, tina koutou katoa. Kia ora everyone and welcome! My name is Caitlin, I'm in the Healthy Families Waitakere team at Sport Waitakere. Uh, I'm coming to you from Tamaki Makaurau, Auckland in the beautiful area of Waitakere here today. I'm your host and I've also got my colleague Grace Voinovich online helping out. Kia ora, Grace. Thank you. Big mihi to you all for joining this corridor today. We, we are joined by three awesome people from across the motu and they'll each be sharing various tools and examples of social innovation and systems change. First up, we will hear from Finn Mackesy, who is the Social Innovation Lead and Director at Resilio Studio, based here in Tamaki Makaurau. He'll talk you through their work in regenerative design, systems literacy, and design thinking, and how they have applied these to influence various projects and work practices and their learnings in this journey so far. Finn wanted to share a document that you are welcome to look at while he is talking um, and while he is presenting. So I have put a link to the document um, in the chat on Zoom and it is also in the Zoom, the chat on Facebook. So please feel free to open this while he's speaking. We will leave some time at the end of his presentation for him to answer any of your questions. So please, we invite you to write your questions or comments into the chat on Zoom or on Facebook and Grace and I will put these to him at the end. At 11.30, we will hear from George Leipold and Emily Preston. They'll be talking about co-designing ways that trusted adults in rugby league can support young people going through tough times. George has recently joined the Healthy Families Hut Valley team as a lead systems innovator. And prior to that, he was in the Healthy Families Ototahi Christchurch team. This is where he worked alongside Emily, um, who's the Senior Project Lead at Innovation Unit on this particular kaupapa. We will also have time at the end for George and Emily to answer any of your questions. So please write into the chat while they're talking. And if you have any burning questions for Finn, uh, we can also please write those questions as well. And we can also ask them to him at the end as well. So let's kick off. Finn, please make sure that you're um, not on mute. Um, and welcome. Kia ora e hoa, if you can share your slides. Can you see my slides? Yes. Well, if you Sorry. want to make them... Um, Full screen, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Finn. Can you see? Yes, perfect. Awesome. Kia ora koutou. Um, lovely to be here and thanks for the opportunity to share. So um, my presentation is going to be quite, um, I guess, cerebral. I'm going to focus on, I guess, the, the kind of conceptual frameworks and theories around some of the work we do, knowing that um, I'm missing out, you know, the key elements of, of practice around kind of heart and hands. Uh, but I'm, I think for uh, the time we have together, I thought I'd um, try to convey information and um, hopefully there might be time to discuss some of this and kind of ground it. So um, as mentioned, I run a design practice and I guess one of our, one of, possibly one of the key things that differenti differentiates us in this space is our focus on ecological design and uh, working with uh, I guess kind of ecological literacy and what we learn from the natural world to inform how systems work and operate in, in reality. So before we try uh, interacting in a system, we find it's a really good practice to just take a step back and actually try to understand the values and beliefs that inform the assumptions we have and that others have about the systems we're working in. 
And so I'm not inviting us to do that now, but just as a, as a general practice, I think we launch into systems change without actually fundamentally questioning the assumptions on which um, our aspirations are based on. Um, the key concepts I wanna talk and share with you uh, over the next you know, 20 minutes is around systems and more specifically adaptive living systems and briefly touch on resilience theory from an ecological perspective, the rebuild theory of change, and then regenerative design and specifically a particular uh, design framework that we use quite a lot in our practice. So I'm just going to launch into it and I'm going to travel uh, hopefully at a fairly quick pace. So one of the most useful frameworks we've come across in terms of understanding systems is David Snowden's uh, Kunafin framework. And one of the things that's great is he distinguishes between four types of systems. And one of the things we've realized is generally speaking is people don't spend the time to distinguish between the type of system that they're wanting to change. So uh, this framework provides these, these four, I guess, kind of quadrants, four types of systems, simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic. And uh, again, in the kind of social innovation space, one of the things we've observed is that people don't necessarily distinguish between complicated and complex systems. And a lot of the work out there is really well intended and is probably focused on um, complicated systems when in reality they're actually addressing um, complex systems and complex challenges. So the other great thing about this framework it is allows us not just to categorize or to understand the type of system we're working into, but also how um, the most or what the most effective way to work in that system is. So simple systems are characterized by best practice. You know, it's very predictable, very knowable. Complicated systems are characterized by good practice. You, if with enough knowledge and enough understanding and insight, you can kind of feel your way into it and go, cool, if we do this, these kind of things are predictably going to happen. Once we start moving into complex systems, which all living systems are, we need to take a different approach. We need an emergent kind of uh, response. And as opposed to simple and complicated systems where you can kind of stand back and look and try to understand, in complex systems, you actually need to probe, you need to engage in the system and then make observations about what you're observing and then respond. And so this is um, using the Kunafin framework, it's called emergent practice. And so what distinguishes these systems is essentially the relationships um, that happen and, and the cause and effect relationships within systems. Uh, and I'm not gonna uh, go into any detail around chaotic systems, um, but yeah, so this is one of the frameworks works that we use and I'm going to build off of this. So in particular, looking at complex systems, particularly ones that we're wanting to change, it's really important to understand how systems, how complex living systems naturally change. So this is, um, again, from ecology, the work of Gunderson and Holling have, looking primarily at forestry systems, have started to uh, identify a, a pattern of change that all living systems seem to go through. And what this framework allows us to do is to take a step back and try to understand or take a step into, but to try to um, identify where in this adaptive cycle uh, the systems that we're trying to impact are, are at. Um, so very briefly, I'll, I'll cover off the, the four phases. So um, typically systems have an exploitation phase, which is characterized by taking advantage of available resources and energy and opportunity. And through that process, relationships are built, complexity is built into the system, um, increasing connectivity and increasing development and maturity in the system. And this happens over long periods of time. And as the system moves into conservation phase, it becomes more complex, it's more able, it has more capability, more capacity to do things. And the relationships between the individual elements are tighter. They're more, they're more locked up, I guess, as it were. And so all the niches are typically filled. And systems, living systems typically stay in conservation as long as they can. And also, often at their own detriment, they'll hold on and resist change for as long as they possibly can. And inevitably, there'll be a release phase. And in that release, um, some of the com complexity is lost and some of the connection is lost as well. And that can be catastrophic or it can be more of a creative destruction in where there's new space and new energy for new ideas to emerge. And very quickly, the system moves into reorganization. It tries to stabilize itself and um, create a new normal. And in certain situations, it can do so in a way where it, it 
the new normal is very much akin to the previous system. Um, in some situations, it, the, the system has shifted so significantly that it reorganizes into a new type of system. Um, for what it's worth and for the purposes of today, I'll put my, my own two cents worth in to say is, you know, my take on where um, global industrial society is, is somewhere in here. We're in late conservation, from my understanding of things, which has huge implications when we're looking about systems change, because the system's always changing anyway, and knowing where it is allows us to kind of try to meaningfully take action. So arguably, you could say that we're already in a release phase, and that's what COVID has presented, um, but I'll pick that up again. So what does that mean for us as designers when we're thinking about types of systems and this adaptive cycle? Well, so loosely speaking, you could say design can be brought up, can be divided into two broad general categories or two types of two approaches. And one of them we're calling here sequential. And this works really well when dealing with com complicated systems. So if you're building a highway or a bridge or something of that sort, um, it's typically known as, or more, most commonly probably known as the waterfall approach. You'll enter through a series of, of gateways. And once you cross those gateways, you don't go back. And so, you know, we know enough about motorway design and implementation that you can basically move through one stage in the design process to the other without needing to go back at all. And that's the key thing is it's a linear process and you keep moving forward. This process, however, is almost completely ineffective in dealing with complex systems. So we need a different approach. And this is what we're calling um, generative design approaches. And this is where we're probing. So from the very instance, we're starting to engage and interact into the system and then learn from it as we go. And so taking a, a sense probe response approach, you, you, your first engagement might be trying to test something, trying to um, test assumptions or understand the, the context in which you're working. And then you use those learnings to inform your next steps. And through a process of kind of um, success and failure, uh, you figure out how you can most effectively make change into the system. You can figure out where the leverage points are, um, where the key opportunities are, and where the major challenges are. So stepping sideways briefly to looking at uh, resilience theory. So again, I'm not talking about uh, resilience from an engineering perspective or from a psychological perspective, but from uh, an ecological uh, reference point. So this here is typically known as uh, the ball and cup model. And it's, there's several out there, but this is quite a reasonable one for today's purposes. So we have our system um, represented by the ball. And the system will undergo any number of changes over its, its lifetime. It goes through the adaptive cycle. And as it does so, it'll kind of bounce around. And the, the cup, as it were, is the system's resilience. It's the, the walls of this valley that allow the system to, uh, uh, to not have to undergo significant change, kind of chaotic or too much destructive change. So they actually help the system continue to function more or less as it is. And if we're interested in the health and well-being of the system, it's really important um, that we uh, try to, I guess, kind of stabilize or create as much buffer for this system as we can against external shocks as well as internal disturbances. And so this concept of resilience is really built into these walls. And if the resilience of the system is eroded, these walls become kind of lower, as it were, and disturbances have the ability to knock the, the ball into, you know, an adjacent valley. And that's actually a, 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 that's a state change. So the system, we don't know what's going to happen when it changes to that degree. And so we, um, generally speaking, we, we try not to encourage uh, systems to, to move into a new state change, particularly complex systems, because we don't know the result. So again, from a systems change point of view, the concept of resilience becomes, I think, quite important. So as a, as a design practice focused on sustainability, <clears throat> We've been having conversations over the years and realizing that uh, sustainability is not a universal, i.e. different people have different um, perspectives within, I guess, the within the sustainability spectrum. And so this is a model by uh, Kerry McGregor that we've come across called the Four Shades of Green that we think is particularly useful. And one of the things it allows us to do is to have more meaningful conversations with people along the spectrum, but also allows us to kind of ground ourselves and understand our own perspective more intimately. And so we place ourselves very much in the dark green um, paradigm. 
Um, so dark greens believe that there are limits to growth and that we must start to build structures, institutions, and patterns of living in a world with less complexity, energy, and resources than today's. And so there's a whole background to this, but I guess I just wanted to introduce it to um, share, I guess we found using this dark green lens quite useful in our work because then we're um, aspiring for dark green outcomes. Even when our clients aren't necessarily, it gives us a lens in which to think about systems change. So when we're thinking about all of this, we're thinking about adaptive systems going through kind of their own life cycles. We're thinking about resilience and a whole range of things that can disturb systems. Um, we're, we need to take a step back and look at the, the global predicaments. What are those um, wicked problems that have the potential to significantly uh, interrupt and destabilize the systems that we're wanting to essentially protect and nurture? And so this is an incomplete list that we've put together of a range of those predicaments. And I call them predicaments. They're not, um, they're not problems in the sense that they're not really solvable. They're predicaments and that we can only really respond to them. And so in complicated systems, you can, you can problem solve quite easily, um, or usually, is you, you stand back and you kind of understand the system enough and you figure out what's not working. Because complex systems have so many emergent properties and they're so complex, um, you know, we have chronic issues like poverty, you know, how long have we been trying to solve poverty? And yet, you know, arguably we're nowhere closer to doing so. So that's an example of a predicament. So there's all these um, global threats and the more globally interconnected we become, the bigger these risks are because again of that interconnectedness is where, where COVID has shown us that <clears throat> we're definitely, um, we're interconnected at that global scale and what happens to others also happens to us. So what does all this mean? Um, similarly to the last 200 years, which um, as a result of essentially the abundance of cheap energy, we've been on this staircase ascent process with increasing complexity uh, <clears throat> and therefore increasing potential and diversity within the system. It looks like now that we're at essentially peak energy and peak complexity, the next 200 years will be marked by a series of staircase simplifications. And so from what I think I understand about uh, both ecological and cultural and primarily civilization um, uh, kind of adaptive cycles is that what's likely going to happen is there's going to be a series of kind of interruptions or disturbances that will result in simplifications. And then there'll be a stable periods of stabilization and normality. And then there'll be some other event that happens that disrupts the system. And there'll be another phase of simplification. And in the moment when these simplifications are happening, and you could argue right now we're in the middle of one through COVID, they seem um, uh, very significant and, and they cause lots of um, hardship and uncertainty, and then things normalize. And once they normalize, there's a new normal. I'm sharing all of this because I guess it's good to have a long view about the systems we're working in and what's predictable about the future. And I think a lot of our cultural narratives about what's likely is not actually likely. Um, and so using an ecological worldview to stop ground um, us into our likely trajectory helps us to think more creatively and more strategically as well as tactically about how we engage in systems. And so just Five really minutes, briefly. Sorry. Sorry. Well, Five minutes. <laughs> thank you. So really briefly, um, Looking at theories of change, there's, I guess, two distinct um, camps that I guess are quite familiar to probably most people. Uh, one, we have the reform, you know, how do we improve the existing systems um, by kind of tinkering and, and yeah, again, making incremental changes to improve them. And then we have the typically more violent approach, which is we just over, overthrow the system because it's not working for us and replace it with something that's better. Um, and, there's a, a third model that I think is actually quite a, a useful conceptual framework in thinking about systems change in the 21st century, which is a build or a rebuild model where we're building or rebuilding parallel social structures and institutions that either make the existing model redundant or supplants it when it's no longer proves useful. And so instead of putting a lot of our resource into trying to change systems that may not actually be fit for purpose, moving forward and will eventually 
um, unwind themselves through process of simplification? How do we target establishing parallel social structures that are fit for purpose now and might be scaled appropriately? So they might be much more local in nature. And so as a quick example might be, as opposed to trying to take on um, global debt-based fiat economic or, or global economic model, you know, um, debt-based fiat economics, uh, m we might start looking at setting up um, local time banks. We might look at local currencies and regional currencies and things like that. So we're actually investing now in the types of systems that are actually going to be viable long term, as opposed to trying to fix a system that ultimately is probably too broken to fix. So very briefly, I'm going to touch on the framework of the seven forms of capital. Uh, we use this in pretty much all of our projects, and we find it really useful for several reasons. One of them is it allows us to see capital as uh, a lens to uh, understanding real wealth that's already existing and that can be built. And so say for one of our projects, we are engaged to do a park redevelopment. That would be a reasonable enough uh, example. And so the outcome that our client's looking for typically sits in the, the built capital form. You know, they, they want a playground and a, a new shared path and whatever else that is. And we go, that's awesome. We can deliver on that. But let's step back and kind of audit and see what existing forms of natural capital already exist in this place and in these communities. And how do we work with and leverage those and help support them? Additionally, how do we use this project of building built capital to create other forms of capital like natural capital? You know, is this an opportunity for riparian restoration? If there's a stream or a creek running through the park, is this an opportunity to um, support Ahika or the re-presencing of Manafenua back into place through cultural narratives, through um, any number of means. Can we create bumping spaces where people can come together and connect and meet, et cetera, et cetera. And so what it does is it allows us to very consciously um, using, you know, I guess a, a, an existing framework to try to maximize the wealth that we're building into a project while still meeting our clients' expectations. And collectively, those make up some of the foundational frameworks that, um, that we use as a design organization that informs our understanding of the world and how we uh, engage with it. So I've shared the handout, and I haven't gone into it in detail because there's quite a lot there, but essentially what we've tried to do is unpack our learning so far through um, trying to unpack what doesn't work and what we have found does work in this space. I know that was a really long run and very fast paced. Um, so thanks for sticking with me and hope that's been useful. Aww. Kia ora fan. Um, lots of really useful frameworks to guide um, our work, isn't it? That's awesome. And I really like how you said that um, it's not linear. Um, the, the kind of the design approach and, and that um, when we're dealing with kind of complex systemic problems like poverty and obesity and climate change, um, we need a different approach um, in dealing with these complex issues. So thank you, Kelda, for your kōrero. We do have a question here um, and a few comments as well. Um, thanks heaps, Ben. This is from Kathy Powell. Do you have any examples of where racist systems have been rebuilt? What were the levers that enable that? Ooh, um, my mind's racing with examples. So I think there's international cases that we can learn from. So, you know, things like some of the process in uh, South Africa, from what I understand. So I'm not an expert in this space, it's probably a good starting point. But, um, you know, from what I've learned, uh, around some of the truth and reconciliation processes in South Africa. I think there's a lot to learn there. <clears throat> uh, I think racism is a really difficult one because in part, the, the powers that be are typically the entitled ones who can't see the, the, how systemic racism plays out. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's some really good work being done in Aotearoa to address that. Uh, 
I would suggest that this is probably a whole other talk in and of itself, and I don't think I'll be able yeah. to do it justice. Um, but I do know of a few kind of uh, initiatives that I think are starting to trying to uh, address this. But I do think there is, there needs to be policy change. You know, we do we do live in a uh, you know I'll be out about it a white supremacist nation, and mm -hmm. um, and a lot of our policies systemically discriminate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is from Kerry Allen Finn. This is a really useful model. Thanks, Finn. Do you introduce these models to stakeholders and communities you work with so that they can understand the concepts or do you use them internally? Typically internally. Um, some of it we might share more broadly. And I guess we, in our projects as much as possible, try to build capability and capacity into those people we work with. And so these models are more useful probably in many instances depends on the project, but for our clients. And so, uh, but it's, it, we use them internally and at times we'll cater or tweak them to be in some instances more uh, politically palatable um, than others. But yeah, primarily they're, uh, they're kind of an in-house framing. Yeah, okay. Cool, Kia ora. thanks, Finn. Um, just a reminder that um, the document that um, Finn wanted to share with you, you can, um, link through to it from the chat on Facebook or on Zoom, but it'll also be sent out with the recording um, after this as well. We have another question here from Nicole Dryden. Um, kia ora, Kathy. good question. Take a look and follow our Te Awa Tupua Uruwira Taranaki Maunga stories of the Māori worldview being primary view and including legal personhood and ongoing redesign of structures, policies, outcomes for wellbeing. Okay, not a question, but a beautiful comment. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, well, um, I think we'll move on to the next presentation. So kia ora Finn, um, and George and Emily, if you would like to make sure that you're not on mute and um, bring up your slides and kia ora. Here are you, there. Thank you so much, kia ora, and um, thank you, Finn. That was an amazing introduction to lots of really interesting and complex concepts. We're gonna take a slightly different tack with our presentation. We're gonna deep, deeply dive into the practical and grassroots and um, much less theoretical. So I think that's a nice kind of balance and hopefully um, you'll see some of this stuff reflected as we talk. Um, so thanks for the lovely introduction. Um, I'm Emily Preston. I'm a project lead with Innovation Units and we do uh, work that develops solutions for thriving societies, um, big thing. <laughs> in practicality, what that means is that we do a lot of co-design work with various communities and also think about that from a systemic point of view to think about how we can create impact at scale. So um, I'm going to be presenting alongside George today. We're a bit of a double act. Um, and that was also true in this project that we'll be talking about. So I was kind of holding the process um, and George at that time was very much the on the ground guy who was um, making me avoid using too much jargon um, and getting too conceptual, which I'm sure he will stick with today as well. Uh, kia ora, Ian. thanks for that. Kia ora koutou everyone, uh, kujo sleep old aho. Um, when I first became involved in this project, I was working with Canterbury Rugby League as a capability manager. I was also delivering the New Zealand Rugby League Coach Development Program on behalf of the Southern Zone Rugby League. And as Caitlin had mentioned earlier on, I've moved into Systems Innovator's role now, initially with um, Healthy Families of Tahi, and now as a Systems Innovator in the Smoke Free Environments with uh, Healthy Families Hut Valley team. And I wanted to acknowledge these organisations because to me they've been quite significant in supporting the mahi that's been undertaken throughout the course of this project. So. To me, it's important that they are acknowledging that because I've had significant contributions in, into this space. I suppose in terms of my role within the, within the project team, I'd probably best describe it as an interpreter of the worlds, of the systems within those worlds, and a translator of the language, as Ems has mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, but for today, um, I'll be sharing the journey from a rugby league space. Um, so, kia ora for that. Awesome, thank you. 
So cracking on. So this project was all about, um, it was called the Trusted Leaders Project to start with, although we moved away from that a little bit. And it was about how we can better support young people in rugby league who are going through tough times. Um, a bit of background, there's way too much text on these slides. I'm sorry, I hate doing text heavy slides. I won't read it all through, um, but obviously I'll provide it to you guys afterwards in case it's useful for you. Um, so uh, we were aiming to build the capability of, and confidence of trusted adults within the rugby league community to support young people who are experiencing distress. Um, this came about because the Health Promotion Agency and the Ministry of Social Development recognised that actually the rugby league community was in a really strong position to support young people who were not reaching out to the existing services and things which were available to them and that there was a real issue with distress within that community and Canterbury was was chosen for a, a lot of reasons but primarily because it had very strong leadership um, a real kind of compelling case for change and was acknowledged as a community that was really ready to undertake this and had an appetite to do so. Yeah, I think just um, jumping on the, to your comments here too, Ems, is from a rugby league's perspective, one of the great things that came out of this project is that we had two central government agencies recognising an opportunity to support our rangatahi through sport, and their investment di directly back into the grassroots level of the sports was quite significant in influencing the change that we, we have seen in rugby league. I just wanted to make sure that we, we share that information with the, with the people. Thanks, Thanks George. Um, and you'll see that we had a big team, we had a lot of people involved in, in this Culpepper and that was um, very deliberately done because we recognised that this was part of a, a bigger system that um, had a lot to contribute and also had a lot to kind of um, rebuild I suppose. Um, so we had Lavar, who brought an amazing wealth of experience and knowledge around mental health. We were operating in a space where it was really important that we were very mindful of how we were operating and how we were talking about things um, and, you know, really using their, their knowledge there. And then a bunch of others around here. Canterbury Rugby League and the community very much at the centre. But thinking about, you know, this is a project. There is an end to our ability to do this particular process, but we don't want to leave the community in a position where they're not supported to take forward whatever they want to. So we were thinking about that sustainability and healthy families, Sport Canterbury, those guys on the ground who are there to, you know, support and activate and um, enable and empower communities were a really important part of that. And we also have shout out to Dave Jeffries there as well. He was part of this project and is also on this call. Um, yeah. And as innovation unit, we were really there to kind of support and hold the process. And that process looked a bit like this. So it's a kind of classic social innovation process, looks very linear, isn't really. <laughs> but um, it's easier to um, keep people knowing where they're going if it, you simplify things. Um, you'll see there is a loop in there. So the kind of try and refine piece that, that Finn um, alluded to a little bit as well, you know, that kind of generative design is, is really part of this. But we start from really trying to understand the community's experience of what a challenge is. And then obviously kind of walk alongside our co-designers, that community, as they design solutions that can help with that and then test and refine as we learn with a view to hopefully building something that can be sustainable. We also have a set of mindsets that we actually use a lot in our work at Innovation Unit because we recognise that there's a lot of tools out there, but the what we do only works if we are able to be a certain way when we're doing this work. So we're, we're very kind of um, forthright, I guess, about the different challenges that that poses for how we are as humans. Um, and you'll see them down the side. These are, are really challenging for everybody, I think, including you know, people like me who do this work all the time. Some of them come very naturally. People are the experts in their own lives. It's something that I believe at my core, and that's why I came to this work. But comfort with the prospect of failure, being in the grey, things like that are a continual uh, challenge. So bringing these to the surface at the start enables people to be a bit more comfortable when they're going through that process. Yeah, I think from a, a rugby league world, um, the concept of failure was, was something that took our community quite a bit to come to grips with because it contradicts, the, you know, the mindset of sports in general. Um, and so 
for them to become comfortable, it was it was quite a quite a, a shift away from where they had been, and it took some some time for us to get our our people comfortable, you know, and at ease with uh, what we were talking about in this area. Thanks, Em. Okay, so as I said, we start from really understanding the lived experience and what this challenge actually feels, looks, tastes like for the people that we're working with. And we developed a set of, actually there's 11 insights, so I'm not going to go into them in too much detail, but there's a report available if you'd like to. I'm gonna flip through them very briefly. Um, these came from our co-designers. So we had a group of young people, players. We had a group of adults who were coaches, managers, volunteers, um, board members, a whole bunch of people who were from the rugby league community in Canterbury. And then they also went out and talked to other people. So we used a process called peer-led insight gathering, where we trained up and supported and provided tools for those young people to go out and talk to other young people, for those adults to go out and talk to other adults. And then we brought all of that back together um, and kind of supported a synthesis process where they could um, reflect on what they'd heard and bring out what they thought were the key themes and key insights. So I'll run through them very, very briefly. You'll see on each of these, there's a kind of headline, but there's some detail underneath. And in black, there are some kind of quotes uh, which show where it came from. So in all of this, we're showing our line of sight so we can make sure that we're not misinterpreting and we're really kind of um, being very serious about our, our role as Kaitiaki of those stories and those voices and, and supporting those to be heard. So number one, the rugby league community is at its heart a family. At the same time, involvement in rugby league creates its own pressures for young people. So pressures around kind of competition and injury and um, time and expense are real. There were, there were some real challenges in there. There's a bigger picture of young people balancing multiple commitments, pressures and stresses at home, school and beyond. So these young people were doing so many things. Their lives were full and this was another thing they were doing. It wasn't the only thing they were doing, even though it was the core focus for this work. But they use a range of coping strategies to deal with stresses in their lives. And this was really important because we started off with a very clear scope around how adults support young people. Um, and we heard very early on that that's just not the reality. Some adults do, but young people support young people. Young people actually use a lot of self-care strategies already. Um, so we needed to look much more holistically at what it takes and what's useful in supporting young people. Um, there were significant barriers to young people showing worries and problems with adults in their lives. They were worried that people wouldn't understand or that they would add additional stress to people who they cared about. But there are key individuals in the rugby league communities with the skills and relationships to be a source of support to young people in distress. So there were people who were already doing a really important role here, but kind of flying solo and without much support around them as they were doing that. Um, we asked them about examples of times when support had been really effective and those examples involved a whole group. It wasn't an individual, it was a whole bunch of people as a community coming together and wrapping around somebody. Uh, that was really important. Uh, distress is unpredictable, difficult to identify and complex to address. So the fact that distress didn't necessarily happen at the point of a trauma it could be afterwards it could be triggered by something else it could be very hard to see it could be it could look like someone disengaging from rugby league altogether in which case how do you address that if you're in the rugby league world are you able to reach out is that overstepping there was a lot of complexity there adults within rugby league are role models to young people we kind of knew that um, it's got a shadow side. It's hard to talk to someone you really respect and who is a role model about something that is vulnerable. Uh, supportive and positive relationships are powerful in helping young people cope with the normal stresses of life. And the rugby league community's aspirations for its young people are broader and more varied than just sporting success. And that last one was um, really important and actually a really um, surprising thing for some of those people in the room some of the young people had not realized how much their coaches cared about them as individuals just jumping in um, from that space too Ems, in terms of i suppose a rugby league world one of the things the project team needed to remember was that you know they had they didn't understand co-design they didn't understand system change so they were going through a journey of learning throughout the course of this process 
So we we at times needed to stop and pause and, and in order to reflect and bring people uh, more into the space um, that we were going through. We also needed to make sure that we had the right people at the table sharing their stories. Because in essence, if it was an adult trying to tell a young person, this is what our life is, it's not going to work. And so the young person's voice was, was really key. And I suppose as a project team too, when you're, what we identified is that when you're working with a volunteer environment, time is of the essence and, and, and most people are time poor. And so initially what we tried to do was all bring them into the central point, but we ended up going out to them in terms of the, and, and getting the information from the, them at regional camps and, and um, for, for our youth. So there were some really good learnings around how to engage with the community, along with lots of difficulties that came with it. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, George. Um, so all those insights we used uh, to develop some how might we questions. Um, so you're probably fairly familiar with kind of human centered design, this sort of process, or I will not teach you to suck eggs. There's some theory on the left if you want to look at it. But basically, we're just flipping those those insights into things that we can respond to and look for solutions to. So how might we help adults in rugby league to understand what to do when a young person needs help? How might we back the people in the league community that young people reach out to already for emotional support? So how do we support the supporters? How might we make sure that our young people know that we care about the great stuff they do on and off the field? It's not just one way to be successful in rugby league, but a lot of people didn't realize that. Um, how might we make rugby league more supportive so young people feel confident to ask for help? How might we better support young people through the stresses of playing? And how might we help Fano and other people who are involved in young people's lives to understand the challenges they're facing? So some, some pretty practical ones and actually quite a holistic list um, based on the insights that we heard. And we use those as a basis for generating some solutions. So as George mentioned, we went out to some training camps. So we had our kind of core group of co-designers, which were based in Christchurch. Uh, but for ideation, we wanted to go broader. We wanted to get lots of different perspectives. And we also wanted to check that those insights we've gathered um, might be useful and relevant to people outside of this particular community. So we went to Rotorua, we went to Dunedin, we went to places where young people were gathering already because you know they had plenty on, we had to go to where they were. And we heard that those uh, insights resonated and we got lots of thoughts on how we could do this. And actually four key ideas started to emerge. We have a lot of ideas, they're not lost, they're all uh, ready for use if we want to, but the four main ideas that came out of this, I'm going to run through very briefly now. And we went through two rounds of prototyping as well. So each of these things have been tested. Two of them are only tested once with young people um, and two of them tested twice with young people and the broader community. So I'll speak to that a little bit as well. So the first idea called Fano Connections, and this is a little bit of our kind of theory of change around you know, why it could be useful. So if we give young people a platform to share the messages they want to with adults in their life and support them in practical ways to make it happen and make sure the young people are leading in what they share and how they do it, it should lead to these positive outcomes. So this idea was really about um, providing a space and a platform for young people to share messages with the wider rugby league community. So whether that's skits or songs, celebrating stuff that they do outside of rugby league, whatever feels important for them to share, the rugby league community, the coaches and managers and volunteers would give them that space and support them to do that in practical ways. It's run by youth, it's led by youth, but with support so that they're actually kind of bridging that gap between Fano and the kind of rugby league world. The second one, again, is a youth led one. So a youth channel, very vague at the moment. So if we provide a dedicated space for young people to connect with each other across club boundaries and let it be led and shaped by those young people and put support in place to ensure the safety of posters without limiting freedom of expression, and provide access to relevant information and resources, hopefully it will lead to these positive outcomes. So again, youth led, but this is about youth to youth. So looking at that peer support, how can we um, enable those young people to recognize that other young people are struggling too, and actually what they're feeling is normal, and actually it's fine to ask for help, and there's some coping mechanisms that are helping people. 
and there's other support available. How do we normalize that? So this started off being a Facebook page. You can tell that that was in a session which had some older people, such as myself, in it. We tested this the first time uh, with a bunch of young people who were like, no, nah, Facebook is dead. Here's some other options. So we've got some useful feedback on this already. Um, these two haven't been tested that second round yet because the young people we were working with were too busy. They had too many other things going on and we could only test it by being youth led. So hopefully they'll get tested into the future. The next two are more able to be led by adults or a mix of younger and older people. So community wellness hub, people love a hub, but this is um, quite a specific type of hub. So this is about encouraging the community to share and learn more about how to support each other's well-being and connecting those people who are already supporting others and creating space for conversation about what's happening, what's working and what's challenging. So it's almost like the youth channel, but for older people as well. So those people who are already doing really positive things and supporting each other can support others to do that. They can bring their problems, they can bring solutions, they can engage with experts or not. Um, whatever is useful for them, led by the community. It could be online, it could be physical, it could be anything. So it went through a round of testing as a concept, which was positive, and it went through a second round of testing at the Pacific series, which we'll talk a bit more about in a moment, with a pop-up uh, hub space, which had a bit of a mixed reaction. People weren't entirely sure what they were engaging with. Some people thought it was like a kind of um, acute distress sort of help tent situation. Um, yeah, so there's, there's plenty we've learned about what didn't work with that and some ideas about what might work better. And a lot of those solutions were actually about, um, so the suggestions about what would be helpful were more about the practical stuff, bringing in um, secondhand kits and massage and you know, all those things which actually the community um, would benefit from in a practical sense and would kind of congregate around. So some, some interesting things that could come out of that. And finally, um, work, work in progress title, I keep saying that, but no one's given me a better one, um, Wellbeing Superheroes. So this is about having individuals in the community who young people can confidently talk to about what they're going through and giving those people a visible marker so they can be easily identified and making sure they have effective training and support, both specialist and peer. And hopefully that will lead to these positive outcomes on here as well. So we tested this with adults um, we decided it would have to be adults to adults, otherwise they are putting young people in a vulnerable position, so that was decided to not be a good option. Um, people were willing to do it, people were willing to do the training, people wanted to be in this role. And then at the Pacific series, we gave people some hats to wear, which meant that they were open to talking, they would not be put out by someone talking, they wouldn't take the mickey, and you wouldn't be upsetting them if you went and talked to them. It wasn't extra stress for them. So uh, they were out and about throughout the two days of the Pacific series as these well-being superheroes. They completed some training beforehand, which was the Life Keepers online course. I don't know if anyone's familiar. Um, brilliant course. Uh, LeVar uh, set it up. There's some physical stuff and there's some online stuff. And the online stuff is great because it's really flexible. You can do it whenever you have time. Um, and everybody completed that. And I will pause there for a moment to let George, who is one of Thank our well superheroes, talk. Yeah, because of our time restraint team, we'll probably just jump into the layers of impact. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's really easy in a project like this to focus on solutions, um, those four things. But actually, we very purposefully were thinking about impact in different ways throughout this. So the experience of that design team going through this was really important to us. We modeled well-being practicing practices throughout. We made sure they felt really supported um, and we kind of focused on, you know, building um, the empowerment that can come from being part of a co-design process in that group. Then there's the clubs that engage in the projects. So we had real traction with a couple of clubs and then the wider community who we brought along to walkthroughs and other things. And then beyond that, the wider community again so outside of Canterbury potentially outside of rugby league those are the layers we were talking about do you want to say anything there George yeah no. okay. we'll, we'll keep going oh. all right got about three minutes ends. okay I'm gonna see <laughs> thanks George I'm gonna see if I can share a video I've been having a little bit of uh, technical issues with this so we'll see if I can make it work or not 
Maybe body hold your breath. Ah, okay. Okay. This is the right one. So my name is Archie Jacobs. Um, I'm involved in rugby league through coaching. Probably the biggest learning for me is that our young people have a lot of great ideas. We just need to create a safe environment for them to feel comfortable in sharing those ideas. And this program, well, this, this particular project, I think, has provided that. Uh, we've, we started to see from when we first started to now where we are, uh, where the young people that have been involved uh, are quite open around their conversations happy to engage in conversations uh, with adults and even today having conversations with adults who haven't been involved in the project and feeling comfortable with that, so that's pretty cool. Oh, my name is Kais Fatili. I've been playing rugby league since I was about six years old. I guess I've learned how much adults really um, want to know about us, and want to know about our lives, how open they are to what, what we think what the youth um what the youth think i've learned a lot about myself i've learned how to express more how to open up more to um to peers and to especially um elders to talk more freely and be more open-minded i guess my name is taola um, i'm currently a part of the Bombay rugby league community i've learned a lot of things especially just from the just from the adults basically and um, have just told me more that we're I guess we're more than like players, we're more than what we perceive as players but we actually have a stand and to say what, what, where we want to be headed. I hope that at the end of this and we come out with uh, something that's tangible, something that we can sort of hold on to. Um, clubs um, across the Kenner Kenner community can uh, use as a tool in supporting young people through distress, creating environments where young people feel comfortable, where they can trust uh, people to talk to. And those those people don't have to be adults. The thing that we're learning the most is that you know, it's not always the adults that have the answers, um, it's certainly uh, not always, um, but what it is is about giving young people an opportunity to give them the environment where they can talk to each other and, and share what's going on. I'm just hoping that there's a more understanding of um, just normalising, just sharing your thoughts, sharing your ideas. A lot of people are struggling with mental health and when they're going through it, they, they don't think they have anyone to turn to, but just normalising sharing. I actually hope to do more of this, like personally, with, um, with more peers. Yeah, because it would have been good to get more um, youth to this program, but I'd like to be able to express this and showcase what I've learned and you know, spread it out to the community. Okay, so hopefully, um that gives you an, an idea of the the experience of the co-designers themselves um, and I've just got one more slide hopefully you're back over to that one um, oh, is that not working? sorry just a second try that yeah. oh and it was all going so well hang on <laughs> Yeah, well, while, while you're Ems, while you're pulling that slide up, just uh, I want to share a bit of a story about Kais, one of the young males that in that video clip. In the year that they did this, uh, we started the the, the Trust of Leaders program. Kais was at school. Um, you know, he was playing 
that year he had 43 games of contact sport. He was at school, studying for NCEA, playing first 15 rugby, playing club rugby league. He was a representative rugby league player, regional uh, foot level, as well as for New Zealand and Samoa. And then at the same time, he had a contract with uh, the North Queensland Cowboys. So in, in that whole process of at that time, he was also trying to juggle all these other worlds to make sure that he didn't let his, let his mates down, as well as not let his family down, his school down, and all those other things that contribute to it. And it's a really good example of how our youth can at times get lost because as adults, we're looking after what we need from a particular young person as opposed to looking after them from a holistic perspective and looking after man managing their well-being. Because no one in that whole picture said, bro, this is enough. You need to actually rest. So it's a real good learning. And it's a story I share with a number of our, our coaches in the rugby league community now. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, George. Um, and I think we've had basically enough of my voice. So I'm going to leave you with this one and let George get a word in edgeways. So, you know, we, we finished this at the end of last year. We had a lot of positive momentum. We were feeling super positive. And then 2020. Um, but there are some really positive signs that hopefully some of this is taking root. And I'll let George speak a bit more to that. It seems uh, systems change. This is a great heading. Because for me, this is a really good way of showing progress that's taken place in the co-design process without it being results focused. It's a really nice way for me to remind me also that this has been involved throughout the whole course of the last two and a half years. And I suppose some of the key things that have happened with, uh, within the rugby league is that our youth now have a council, which is a voice in the game, their involvement in the sport. So they will influence what rugby league will look like for them moving into the future. Um, from a club landscape, I suppose what's happened is that um, it's influenced how New Zealand Rugby League and Rugby League in general look at our players. Um, we take a holistic view now where um, the player, the person is, is more important. Their well-being and their welfare is a priority. Athlete, the player as a person as an athlete is kind of secondary in that space. So it's been quite a, quite a change in that area. New Zealand Rugby League also have a welfare manager that engages with our youth. Um, in the early parts of the journey, I suppose, from a sports space, what was quickly identified is our coaches, our managers and our trainers, they had the biggest influence on our sports. They are the ones that connect with our players on a regular basis and with our community, but also the ones that create the culture and the attitude within, the, within their particular teams. And so um, and they are the ones who are going to influence the well-being of a person. So. What we did, what we've done in rugby league is we've kind of changed our focus around how to coach as opposed to the technical aspects of the game. And two key areas of that is, is in, the, in the space of, I suppose, um, mental well-being and relationship management. We are, we're now spending quite a significant amount of time unpacking those two topics during the course and then carrying on with additional support with them later on. And as... Uh, Ems mentioned earlier on, Levar Life Keepers is now into the weave within the coach development programs. Um, I suppose checking in was uh, as another process that was in response to COVID-19. And Rugby League made a choice that rather than go out and post all these videos around skills and drills at level three and level four, what they chose to do was to go in and check in on, on our community to make sure our community was okay. But they also needed to have the tools to be able to have conversations where there were concerns about people who had um, issues around mental well-being and weren't coping very well. And that process included an escalation um, a system that they could, could apply. I think for us, the whole thing around the development of the process, the ratification of it, and the implementation took one week within the rugby league community. But the, the note from that is that the mahi that had been undertaken as a course of, as a result of a co-design process had prepared the rugby league community to adopt this really, really quickly. So that was, a, a, for me, has been a, a really huge outcome. And I suppose uh, that probably the last area of this that, that I'll kind of just briefly mention here is that as a result of this, um, the, the work that has been put together over the last couple of years, um, Rugby League is now in a, 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 a place where we've partnered up with healthy families. 
and we've developed a, a document called the Five Phases of Mental Wellbeing in Sports, which is a favourite, um, which in essence captures the rugby league journey, but has been recorded so that that journey can now be shared with other codes. So that's been the intent of what we've, we've done here. So our next steps in that process are to uh, engage in conversations with Sport New Zealand so we, we, the, we can move, now share the journey. Kia ora. Awesome, George. I think that is time. Yeah. Sorry, I can't see the chat while I'm doing this. Um, so yeah, I missed the warning. Right. Um, and that's where we were going to leave it. Thanks, George. Oh, awesome. Kia ora, George and Emily. Um, well, what a really moving video. Um, but also so cool to hear how um, it's way more than just the playing the sport, isn't it, at the end of the day. Um, and there's so many opportunities and so cool that you're um, working with um, New Zealand Rugby League as well. So many amazing out outcomes throughout um, this whole two and a half years. Big nahi to you and all your partners and your team who are involved in that kaupapa. Um, we have run out of time, but um, I have asked people to, um, if you have any questions, to go on to the our Healthy Families Waitakere Facebook page and either post any questions there. Um, or send them to the hfw at sportwaitakere.org.nz email um, and we can um, put them to the speakers and we'll send out the answers with the recording. Um, there has been a few people who've had troubles with the connection today so um, the recording will go up on YouTube and will be sent out to you so um, you'll just have to watch it at a later, a later date. Aroha mai. Um, okay. Um, thank you to all of you who have participated today. George, Emily and Finn, thank you very much for your korero. I'll just close us with a karakia. Kia tau, kia tātou katoa, te atawha, tō tātou aruki, a i karai te miti aroha i te atua, miti whiwhinga, tahitanga, ki te wairua tapu, ake, 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 amene. Ngā manaki tanga everyone. Kia ora, thank you for listening. Ka kite.